Professor Margaret Levy, thank you so much for uh, for, for joining me today. Um, great to talk to you. As always, Matt. Lovely to be with you. You've put forth a, a sort of a scheme of desiderata of or of goals or values that uh, a scheme of property or ownership uh, should uh, should advance. And I want to get to that in a second. I w- I'd like to get into some of the details of 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 what you're saying there. But before we get to the desiderata, I wonder if you could also say a few things about the current property regime in the sense of, you know, what does it get right? What, you know, what, what are some of the things in the way that we formalize property today that you think are worth preserving? Well, one of the things that's obviously worth preserving is staying very firm that people are not property. And I think that we're making some progress backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards on the extent to which we define our labor as property and the kinds of protections that we as individuals have over that. And I think those things are good things. They often depend on collective actions, unions, organizations of various kinds, but there's certainly been an advance and I I would fight hard to preserve that. Um, You know, human trafficking is a scandal, uh, but it's recognized as a scandal, something that might not have been true, uh, not that long ago. So we're making some advance again on these kinds of ways in which forced labor um, are are being treated. I think those things are all good. This may be a bit of a tangent, so we can also return to it later. But um, I'm also curious what you think about the idea of formalization, because it seems to me that one of the major themes in sort of modern property rights is the formalization of of people's dominion over this or that. And that is, of course, a double-edged sword, right? Because the you know, formalization can give you security against uh, undue interference, or it can also uh, a- allow people to exert more dominion than they really ought to have in a way that, uh, you know, prevents larger... My uh, home is my castle. Of- yeah. 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 So I think this actually leads us into the desiderata, because in order to think about formalization, I'd rather not think about how it's been thought of and what it has done, but rather to think about where it should come in to the equation. Um, And I think that is more of an open question than looking at the history of formalization. I mean, it's achieved certain things that are great, and it's made created problems that are horrible. I mean, just as you said, it's got it's a double edged sword. But if we go to the desiderata that I and my team are developing, I think that helps us to think about formalization. So as you know, um, Chris, Dan, Emily, Russell, and I are trying to think through what are the kinds of goals that we want to achieve and that some kind of property rights regime might help us achieve. And those desiderata um, include well-being which is more than economic growth as as defined by GDP. Well-being includes a whole variety of things that talks about all the all the people, <laughs> not just some abstract uh, figure of economic growth, but do people have housing? Do they have food security? Do, do they have um, the capacity to get the kind of education or skills that they need in order to, to function in the world? If they're very young or if they're disabled, do they have the kind of protections that they need to survive? So well-being is a multi, has to do with flourishing in a variety of ways and not just economic growth. So that's desiderata one. Desiderata two, which is really has two parts, is sustainability. So it's sustainability of the planet, its its biodiversity, all of its species, not just its human species. But sustainability is also about various cultures, um, some of them indigenous, some of them um, cultures that are fighting for their lives right now in some of the wars that we're seeing around the world, whether we're talking about Ukraine or Gaza and Israel, or we're talking about the Sudan. Um, Those are fights often over cultural survival. Um, that are a little different than the fights over indigenous survival, though sometimes those two merge into wars. Um, So there's cultural sustainability and there's sustainability of the earth and its biodiversity. 
And then the final uh, desiderata really is a harder one to measure and to describe. I mean, philosophers like Elizabeth Anderson can describe relational equality um, or Deborah Satz, but it's it's a complex notion and it really has to do with a regime of, of property that allows us to treat each other as equals, to see each other as equals, to have respect and dignity. And so we're struggling with how to frame that exactly, but that's that seems to us a very important desiderata um, for us as as a as a people, um, and that that is affected by property rights and affects property rights. I'm curious what your argument is for why these three values are are comprehensive. Why should we be confident that the, that these three desiderata sort of capture the territory of values? So we should be. I think we throw them out there and have a debate. Gotcha. Till we till we feel comfortable or enough of us feel comfortable to proceed on those grounds. But what they do for us analytically and is that they give us a way to rethink and reimagine um and reclaim certain kinds of aspects of property, ownership, sovereignty, um, stewardship, and to think about how to how to organize those or re-develop um, those in ways that serve us better. I mean, that's the goal of it. So it's it's by not just accepting the kinds of values of like economic growth, Mm -hmm. in a narrow sense but saying there are other values out there that we need that we might want to that we might want to attend to so yeah. this this is our argument it doesn't have to you know uh, hopefully it opens a debate um and opens people's minds to the fact that they're alternatives to economic growth well i i like them i i think that these i think the the desiderata you've chosen are quite uh compelling and one of the reasons I like them is that I think that they they do a good job um, uh, covering what feels to me like a me too. smaller set of concerns than, you know, but, let's say growth. And, but Matt, we're not the only people. So, you know, <laughs> and we share some values. So I think it's really important that they um, be debated. I mean, if we're successful, people will say, one, they'll say, oh, yeah, there are alternatives. To what should those alternatives be? Do we like these? Yes, no, maybe, you know, let's tweak it this way, that way. Let's have a real conversation. Well, let me, this, this is, let me just give you my gloss on them. Let me tell you why I like them. And you can tell me why this is a good reason to like them or not a good reason okay. to like them. So <laughs> when I think of, uh, so when I think about this idea of well-being, sort of human well-being, First, and then second, the idea of sustainability within a within a broader context. And then third, the idea of relational equality. They it strikes me that those those three categories of values sort of map onto this idea of like uh uh intra-human values. So well-being is like making sure that human beings are have what they need as individual human beings, right? Then the the sustainability has to do with almost extra human values, like uh, our relationship with nature, our relationship with things that go beyond even human society. And then relational equality is sort of interhuman values. So the you know it is connects to the uh, concepts that you've written about elsewhere in in like political equality. But relational equality, if I understand it correctly, goes beyond political equality. It has to do with uh, you know not just sort of equal enfranchisement of individuals vis-a-vis -vis the government, but ensuring that individuals are able to relate to each other in a more or less equal way so that they can comprise the polity in a in a in a an un undistorted way. Right. Uh, and um so I'm just curious whether that resonates with you, whether that sort of intrahuman, interhuman, extra human uh uh, does that does that track for you? Because for me, that's why I find it so persuasive. That's interesting. Um, yeah, that tracks for me. That that may not be the way. I'd have to think about whether I want to think about it that way. But that tracks for me. Cool. A follow up question would be: 
as you describe it, these things actually start to sound to me a little bit like the kinds of concerns that that one might vindicate through other approaches, such as you know basic rights or yeah. something. So I'm curious how you think about the interplay between you know because pr property interests are usually things that can be you know acquired or disposed of, things that can be gained and lost, and and so. How do you think about uh, vindicating, or how do you think about the sort of complementary roles of trying to vindicate these sorts of interests through a property scheme versus trying to vindicate them through a rights scheme? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I've I've fully thought that one through. Um, and I look forward to thinking through that question. Um, I do think that basic rights are probably part of the story, but they're not enough because relational equality really has to do with interactions and basic rights really has to do with what you're owed, <laughs> what mm -hmm. you get. So you, and I do think rights have a kind of property quality to them because you can lose them and you can gain them. Um, but if you look at the work, for example, that Elizabeth Anderson did on private governance, um, clearly our capacity to own our labor or to control it, at least, uh, has a huge effect on relational equality. So there's clearly, in her mind, um, a big interaction. And we're still teasing that out for how to think about that in our kind of terms. Yeah. I mean, one possibility might be that for one reason or another, there are certain aspects of these values that they can only be taken so far through a rights scheme. And that perhaps, you know, a property scheme might and enable them to be vindicated further. Yeah. Uh, you know, or that there's some sort of a baseline and then an, a more optimal situation that, that you know, property helps us get to. Um, but yeah, there's clearly an interesting, interesting question there. I'm looking forward to um, thinking about it further. Uh, how do sort of questions of distributive justice, for example, uh, come in here? When you think about a property, a system of property or ownership, do you have in the back of your mind, a conception of what well-being entails, so that, for example, you know, um, the neediest in the society reaching a certain level of well-being is of greater value than the wealthiest, you know, achieving uh, some sort of extreme uh, well-being or something. I, I guess what I'm asking is: is your conception of well-being here? Uh, sort of orthogonal to those different sorts of conceptions of distributive justice, or or does it does it roll in some thinking about that? Well, I think there are two answers to that question. One is that our schema doesn't. Yes, the desiderata doesn't necessarily uh, rest on distri distributional justice um, in the sense in which you were talking about it. So it means that no one would be homeless perhaps but it doesn't mean everybody would have an equally similar home so that's not distribu distributional justice so much as you know in terms of of equality at least it's making sure that the base is met for everyone and then there could be lots of variation so that's one level our schema does is non normative in that particular sense okay. now what do i care about i care about distributive justice but that's not in our schema necessarily so if you ask me where i would take this politically i might take it a different place than say chris or emily might right. or you might or jack might or indy might or jane might gotcha uh, so I, I suppose my final, the final area that I'd, I'd love to explore is, um, how you think that this way of thinking about property rights could sort of concretely apply to, to the reform of institutions. Um, do you have any thoughts about how do you, how would you like people to, to take up this set of ideas? Are, are you, are you interested in seeing this guide the 
uh, construction of new property arrangements um, or yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll stop. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're looking to do is to set up a schema that enables people to start thinking differently about what the property arrangement should look like. And the first step in that is debunking the idea that what we have is the only way to achieve whatever goals we have, and that it's natural that we have to keep reminding people that this is socially and politically constructed system, that it serves some things and some interests very well, some goals and some individual interests very well, and not so well on others. And if we think about other desiderata than the ones that have been written into it, we can begin to think about what alternative arrangements like might look like, and then we can have the right kinds of political arguments about which goals we want to achieve and and what the proper means for achieving them are. And that's the kind of that's what I think of as political change is the first step in political change is getting people into that space where they can actually think that there are alternatives and that it's worth debating what those alternatives are. And then you begin to build social movements and actions around those alternatives in order to achieve them. Amazing. I think that's a great place to um, to wrap up. Thank you so much. Appreciate uh, you taking the time. Wonderful. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye, Matt.